All right, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox or CCAST. My name is Christy Miner. I work with the CCAST team at the University of Arizona based in Tucson. I recently joined the CCAST team as the new coordinator for the non-native aquatic species community of practice. Uh, the CCAST team launched this community of practice in May of 2020 with the aim of facilitating information sharing through webinars such as this, as well as workshops and developing decision support tools to improve our ability to address um, the problem of introduced species. So if anyone would like more information on our community of practice, feel free to reach out to email either me or Matt directly. Um, our emails will be available um, shortly in the chat. Looks like they're there now. Um, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions at any point. The CCAS team launched this webinar series in April of last year um, for that purpose of information sharing among researchers and managers in the West. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt. Excellent, thank you, Christy. Uh, so my name is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator for the US Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program and I sit in Tucson, Arizona, in the Southwest region of Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm also the co-director of CCAST with Genevieve Johnson, who works for the Bureau of Reclamation. Today, we're hosting a presentation from Jill Wick of the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. She will be discuss discussing non-native trout removal for support of, not of native fish in New Mexico. Jill Wick is a Native Fish Program Manager for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and has worked for the department since 2008. Jill has worked on post-fire response to the largest wildfire in New Mexico's history, established native fish populations in several streams, and continues to work towards improving conservation status of many of New Mexico's native fish species. As a final reminder here for folks that have joined us late, um, if you have questions during the presentation, we ask that you put those in the chat box as we go and then I'll moderate Q&A after the presentation. So with that, Jill, I think we're ready to hand over to you uh, for your presentation. And Jill, if you're speaking, I believe you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. No? Yes. Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. I don't know why that happens, but it happens all the time. Um, so yes, yeah, so today um, I'm going to talk about a project that I've been working on uh, for more than five years now um, in Whitewater Creek, New Mexico, and it's a non-native trout removal project um, to, to benefit and restore Gila trout. So just a little um, background if you're not familiar with Gila trout, um, they are a native trout species. It's endemic to streams in the Gila, the San Francisco, Agua, Verde, or Agua Fria, and Verde river drainages. So they're only found in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, they were listed uh, as endangered under the precursor to the Endangered Species Act. And then that um, designation as endangered uh, transferred when ESA was passed in 1973. And then as a result of uh, conservation efforts and recovery efforts that were made, they were downlisted to threatened in 2006. Um, major threats for the species now um, include non-native trout, so both hybridization with rainbow trout and predation and competition with other non-native trouts um, like rain well with rainbow trout, brown trout, and brook trout. Um, another major threat for the species is wildfire and of course climate change, which are kind of all wrapped up together. So this project really started with a big fire that occurred in uh, the Gila in 2012, Whitewater Baldy fire. 
So in early 2012, um, this map is showing in the green streams where um, gila trout existed in New Mexico prior to that whitewater ball leaf fire. Um, and so on the left, the um, what I've just put up there on the left there, that is the whitewater ball leaf fire. That was in 2012. And then the following year in 2018, there was another fire, which is the, the fire that's depicted on the right. And this is just kind of to show you that that whitewater baldy fire in 2012 was almost dead center on the majority of the heel trout habitat or occupied heel trout streams that existed at that time. Um, and then in 2013, the silver fire uh, impacted two additional streams. So all in all, those fires re resulted in complete loss of heel trout populations, eight populations, eight out of 16 populations that occurred at that time. So it was a, it was a devastating two years for heel trout uh, conservation and recovery. Um, there was a little bit of a silver lining in that um, some, of the, some of the streams that had non-native trout, that had rainbow trout in them, those also experienced complete loss of fish. So there were a couple of streams where the fires and post-fire flooding um, cleaned those streams out and we were able to put um, heel trout back into those streams. And then the stream that I'm going to talk about today just popped up there in purple um, is Whitewater Creek. And this stream, after um, we did a couple of surveys after the fire, and we found that um, the fire, and it's really the post-fire flooding um, and ash and debris flows that uh, really result in these fish kills. But after the fire, um, when we did surveys, we found that there were still a few uh, rainbow trout surviving down here in this lower section of Whitewater Creek. And there were some rainbow trout that were still um, alive in this upper headwater section. And then in the South Fork over here, um, these triangles depict where we caught, uh, collected individual brook trout. So um, the fire had done a lot of work, but we still had some fish to remove. And this kind of just presented this opportunity to us that um, maybe it wouldn't be as big of a project to try to remove these remaining fish, non-native fish from the stream and be able to put gila trout back into this, into this drainage. Um, so the way that we remove, the best way that we have to eradicate non-native fish is through the use of rotenone. Um, it's a restricted use pesticide, so it can only be used um, by a certified pesticide applicator. It's really the best tool that we have to completely eliminate unwanted aquatic animals. So we can do other things like electrofishing um, or other you know, mechanical removal efforts, but we never can really be sure that we've removed every individual. Um, so rotenone is, the, is how we, we go about fish eradication. Um, it's the product that's derived from the roots of plants from, um, from the Amazon. It only affects gill breathing organisms and it's toxic to fish at low concentrations. So we use it at really low concentrations and those concentrations um, are not toxic to wildlife. And then one of the, um, one of kind of the good things, but also one of the things that makes it challenging is that it degrades rapidly in field conditions. So it degrades rapidly in the presence of light, um, water, and organic material. So just to go back um, to this project, um, the project area a little bit, I just want to talk a little bit more about Whitewater Creek. Um, I know there's not a legend on this map, but I'll tell you a little bit. Um, this dotted line here is um, the Gila Wilderness Boundary. So the majority of this project area is located within a wilderness area. Um, and then these kind of darker brown lines are trails. And so I think what maybe pops out right away is that a lot of this drainage is not very accessible. There's no trails into the majority of the middle of the drainage. Um, and so this really, made it a, a challenging project and a project that we were, you know, just a little bit apprehensive about or, or you know, wondered like, is, it, is this possible? Can we, can we do this? Um, just because it is remote, it's in wilderness, which presents a lot of, um, you know, restrictions and, and it's just a difficult place to access. Um, and then on top of that, you know, this was all recently burned within the last few years of us starting this project. And so, Trail conditions were, you know, this shows that there's a trail there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's actually a trail there because um, 
the conditions on the ground were just, um, there were just down trees everywhere, trails completely washed out and had to be rebuilt. So this project ended up being a whole lot of trail work. Um, almost every single time that we went into the drainage, we had to do trail work. Um, so just some of the major challenges that we knew kind of from the outset of starting this project were, um, like I said, that remote location and minimal access points um, restrictions uh, that go along with it being within a wilderness area. Um, access and trail conditions, like I said, just, um, you know, trails, the presence of a trail on a map didn't necessarily mean that there was access. And because it is within a wilderness area, the only ways to access really the area is by hiking or using pack stock. And in general, um, trails were not in the condition to be able to use pack stock unless we did work on them. Um, and because it is remote, um, you know, there's certainly no cell reception in any of this area. Um, so we knew that communication was gonna be a challenge, um, just being able to communicate among crews while we were implementing the project. Um, making sure we had a way to provide drinking water during a treatment because we obviously are applying a pesticide to the water so we can't drink that water. We need to provide drinking water in some other way. And then um, what probably we didn't really realize to begin with but became um, known fairly quickly was the weather in this drainage is incredibly unpredictable. So the picture that I have up here was from our very first uh, recon trip that we did in, um, and this was in May, I believe this picture was taken on May 18th um, in Southern New Mexico. And we had no forecast of any precipitation and we had a giant blizzard, uh, whiteout conditions um, once we were in there. And some of us actually got turned around and ended up in the wrong place and had to hike back. And, um, and this kind of became the norm. I don't know how many, I probably can't even count how many snowstorms I got caught in in Whitewater in May and June, um, which is not really something we uh, we thought would we would be dealing with. So, um, like I said, we did a, a quite a few recon trips. Um, you know, even before we started uh, thinking of, or you know, really thinking about the project. But um, and we used those trips to kind of lay out a general approach and plan for how to how to do this and. You know, we wanted to obviously start at the top of the drainage, the headwaters, and then move downstream. And so how we ended up doing it was um, finding, laying out a couple um, or a few camp locations. So these stars are our various camp locations. And we started up at the top um, and basically treating sequentially as we go down. So staying at this camp and then treating all of this upper stuff and then staying at this camp the next night treating down to here, staying at this camp, treating down and, and just moving down the drainage that way. So the first year um, we started over here in the main stem. This took us about a week and then we moved over here for the second week and moved down um, the South Fork. Um, so that was kind of our, our general approach uh, to the project, but it just, it made it very complicated because we had all these different camps we were moving to and from. We had different people at different camps. You were at one camp one night, another camp the next night. Um, it was just logistically extremely complicated and extremely challenging. Um, and these upper reaches where you can see we had trail access. So these upper reaches on the main stem and on the South Fork, we were able to pack gear into those locations. So we used pack animals to pack all of our um, equipment for the treatment, all of our camping gear, all of our food, um, things like that. And then in these inaccessible areas, we were um, using helicopters to longline our gear into those locations. Um, so I just, I, I don't think I've ever approached anything that was as logistically complicated as this, but I just wanted to show you a few of my planning documents that I use. Um, so on the left here, like these are all the different um, crews that we had out there. We had different, two different pack crews. We had pre-treatment crews who were collecting pre-treatment information, like setting bucket locations and measuring discharge. Um, we had neutral, two neutralization stations and neutralization crews, treatment crews that were in different locations, but a helicopter to make sure it was going to the right places at the right times. Um, so just it was very, very complicated. 
Um, this was our, our crew roster, um, what their assignment was. And then this is basically like what um, camp they're gonna be staying at every night. And we had this um, set up for the entire two weeks. And so um, I think that a lot of people, everyone on this, on this uh, crew had to put a lot of trust in me that they were gonna have what they needed when they arrived um, to their camp that night. Um, and I think that was hard for some people. <laughs> Um, and then we have, a, you know, a separate plans for the pack, um, the packers and which, where they were going to go on any given day and what they needed to, to bring to each spot and things like that. Um, this was our setup for our helicopter um, long lining. So we used these knack boxes, job, job boxes that contained all the gear and then those were long lined into camp locations um, prior to the project starting. And then, you know, of course we had to have, make sure we had every piece of equipment at each location um, and lots of lists. And then we, you know, the helicopters wanna know how much stuff weighs. So everything that went into one of these boxes had to get weighed. Um, so just a lot of logistical um, uh, complexity. And then as far as the communication part, we did end up primarily using inReach devices. Um, that we could send basically like text messages on and then the four service radios. And between the two of those, we had pretty good communication. There were a few dead spots where we, we couldn't get a hold of people, but for the most part, that worked fairly well with us. Um, we did have one person whose sole job was just um, relaying communication. So they kind of sat up on, on the top of the um, canyon and were able to relay uh, information among the different crews that were out there. So like I said, um, trail clearing, we spent a ton of time um, clearing trails almost every single time that we went into the drainage, even if it was only two weeks apart, we had to cut trees. Um, initially, there were like, this is, these are pictures of the trail. <laughs> um, so just a ton of work uh, clearing trail. We had contractors that did this, but we also did a lot of it ourselves. Um, and then prior to even starting, you know, applying any chemical to the stream, we had to get everything there. So we, like I said, were flying uh, gear in, we were packing things on mules and horses. And then our approach to the drinking water issue was to go in the week prior and collect um, containers of water from the stream uh, to filter for drinking water. So those were all at camp before people arrived at camp during the, the application week. So, um, so all of that, you know, happened before we even put one um, drop of water in this or a drop of rotenone in the stream. And so we, we started this project kind of officially in, um, I think, early 2016 so, or 2015. So it took uh, two years, you know, just to get to the point where we were putting, um, putting chemical in the water. So our approach for the first year of treatment was, um, well, it was gonna take two full, full weeks of treatment. We had uh, 42 people working in the field. Um, our approach was to do bucket spacing at two hours, um, one part per million concentration of rote known, doing a four hour treatment. So letting those buckets run for four hours. And then we had also sprayers um, and, a, and we were applying a sand gelatin mix, which we put in um, like springs and seeps and off channel, um, you know, wetted areas. So right from the beginning, really things did not go as we had hoped. Um, chemical, even from the first day, chemical was not carrying as far as we anticipated. So we would be sitting on a bucket. We had this bucket spaced two hours apart. Um, you know, so there's a bucket and then the amount of time it takes water to get from that bucket to the next bucket downstream is two hours. Um, and we were, we were only maybe killing fish for an hour downstream. And then below that fish were just perfectly fine, swimming around, eating, not even phased. Um, so we tried to adjust our approach and put in additional buckets. So we tried to put in one hour buckets where we could, but in a lot of places that was just like not logistically possible. We didn't have enough people um, to run, you know, to double the number of buckets that we were planning um, and things like that. It was just, didn't work. And so we, our approach was to try to add extra um, sprayers or give extra chemical to sprayers so that they could spray really heavy in that second hour. 
um, below a bucket. But um, in the end, we we did know that, and at least one tributary, we did not get a complete kill. We we saw fish still alive after our treatment, and so we did decide to send a crew back um, in the second week. But again, we didn't we didn't really have enough personnel available to do buckets, so we just um, sent them back with sprayers, hoping they could could spray heavily and and kill those fish. Um, so these are just some. A few photos I want to throw in um, to show you kind of what the drainage looks like and what, what we were tackling. This one uh, really shows what hiking is like in Whitewater Creek. It's, it's, you can move about a mile an hour and, and these are people that basically hike for a living. Um, so it's, it's really slow growing. You're climbing over dead trees constantly, nothing is stable. So everything you step on moves under your feet. Um, it's really challenging. Um, there's some bucket setups. Um, and this is one of our camps on, on the main stem on the upper, um, the upper end of the drainage. Um, the, the second week when we did that South Fork section, um, almost everyone, I think everyone rode in. That was a pretty good haul to get in there. So um, I think this, day we had that everybody was riding in we had like 23 horses or something um and then this was our neutralization station you can see the auger set up down here in the purple water below neutralization so after that treatment um oh i, I guess i did forget to say that on the south fork we did not um we did not see any fish we did not you know find any fish that we killed so um, we went back and did a, a thorough eDNA collection in the South Fork of Whitewater Creek, and we didn't, th that eDNA did not detect any trout. We, we tested for both brook trout and rainbow trout, and we did not detect any trout DNA in the South Fork of Whitewater. So that was great news. Um, but then when we hiked into the upper end of the main stem, um, right away when we got there, we saw fish swimming around. So we did not um, get a fish, a complete kill on the upper end of the main stem. And so after that first year and the problems that we had killing fish, we were kind of wondering if there was something in the water that was, you know, preventing, that was like adhering to the rotenone or, you know, so in some way making the rotenone not as, um, as, you know, potent as we would have expected. And so we did collect water and do a metals, a total metals analysis of the water. And this is, Whitewater Creek is an area that was, um, mined in the early 1800s and so we thought maybe that would have some kind of impact on what was in the water um, and we did find that it had really water had really um, at high level very high levels of calcium magnesium uh, potassium and sodium um, which was interesting but there's really no research out there nobody knows how these metals affect rotenone so it really, in the end, didn't didn't tell us a whole whole lot. But um, I've always found that that's it, it still wondered if that has some impact on what we've seen in this project area. So in 2018, um, we were set to go back in for the second year of our treatment, um, and we decided to make you know some pretty big changes based on what we had experienced the week before or the year before. And so the year before we had done a pre-treatment crew simultaneously with the treatment crew. So we had a pre-treatment crew that was going downstream uh, basically a day ahead of the treatment crew. And that pre-treatment crew was doing things like setting, you know, measuring travel time, setting bucket locations, taking discharge information, all of that kind of stuff was occurring sort of simultaneously with the project. Um, and so that's how we did it in the first year. And we decided in the second year, like, let's do that a week before. Let's get that out of the way so that we can, we don't have to deal with that during the treatment. And so we did all the pre-treatment work the week before the treatment in 2018. Um, some other changes that we made were we added an additional camp location so that we could treat smaller sections. So we weren't um, treating such a large section at a time. Um, we decided we were gonna make our schedule more flexible and stay in a location and basically retreat it until no fish were, were killed, which is basically our benchmark for success is that we do a treatment and we don't see any fish. 
um, we decided we were going to use a lot more in situ bioassays to kind of monitor fish, um, how the fish were, were dying and how if we were getting a complete kill. So we did that basically by putting a bucket out, you know, we would have a bucket um, with a rote note in it, and then we would have sentinel fish in a, in a cage every 15 minutes of travel time downstream, and we would monitor those fish until they died and kind of that would give us more information about how the rote known was carrying in the water. And then um, we would do all one hour buckets. So no more of the two hour buckets because that didn't work at all the week or the year before. Um, so one hour buckets treating at two parts per million. So a, a higher concentration than we had the year before and still doing a four hour treatment. Um, and just as a complicating factor, uh, three days before we were set to, to start the treatment, we had a huge windstorm um, in the project area that broke, blew down like hundreds of trees. And we were able to get an emergency approval from the Forest Service to use chainsaws um, to clear trails so we could implement the project. And in the two days before the treatment started, we cut over 150 trees. So when I say that there are trees falling down everywhere and it's no joke. <laughs> um, so a few pictures from year two. Uh, year two just um, really was very challenging. Um, this was, I think, at the beginning. Um, we were in there for 15 days and it either rained or snowed for 12 of those 15 days. Um, discharge tripled from what it had been the week before. And I think travel times flow increased by almost three quarters. So we were basically just scrambling to get this figured out um, because we were having to change bucket locations, estimate bucket locations. Um, we had to, I think, go out and get more rote known um, on two different occasions because of our, you know, the, the discharge was so much higher than what we were anticipating. Um, so it was really, of an incredibly challenging uh, two weeks in the field. And, um, you know, we, we did the best we could, but those conditions really um, made it difficult. And so after that treatment, the following summer, we went out and did um, intensive eDNA surveys. So this was really, you know, how we were gonna try to document um, whether or not the treatment had been successful. And we didn't, we didn't, in retrospect, um, we didn't have a super clear idea or definition of what we, you know, what was success? What are we looking for? Um, we just said, you know, we want to kill all the fish and um, we're going to use eDNA to, to make sure we did that. But as I think everyone knows, eDNA is a pretty new technology. And so, um, you know, we hadn't used it a whole lot prior to this. So anyway, you'll, you'll see <laughs> where this goes. But we went out and collected eDNA samples every 250 meters throughout the um, entire main stem and all the tributaries. And so this map depicts um, each of those dots is one eDNA collection. So in the orange here on the South Fork, this is the eDNA week collection that we did in 2018 after the first treatment. And um, you know, each of these came back as you know, not, no detection of, of trout DNA. So when, when they do this analysis for environmental DNA, um, they do kind of a triplicate analysis. So there's, um, there's three wells and they um, do an analysis for each of those, those wells. And so the yellow dots show where there was positive, you know, eDNA detected for one well. And then the orange is where there was eDNA detected in two out of the three wells. And then the, th the red shows where um, there was EDN or DNA detected in uh, three out of three wells. So um, as you can see, there was just kind of this scattering of low levels of detection throughout the entire main stem with these two you know, higher, higher detections um, up here on the southern tributary that we call this here, the southern tributary. So this was not, you know, what we were hoping to find. Um, but after we got these results, we went in and did some electrofishing. So we electrofished on the lower end. I mean, basically we electrofished in the areas that we could, you know, fairly easily access. 
Um, we electrofished on this lower end. We did not find any fish. These were both um, two, pass, uh, two passes of electrofishing in both of these surveys. Um, and then we did a two pass survey up here from Lipsy Canyon up the Southern tributary. And this basically this whole reach that you can see in pink is like where our problem area has been from the get go. And so where these two green stars are, are where we pulled fish out with electrofishing, we found two fish. So after we, you know, we did this, we were like, oh, you know, awesome. Maybe, maybe we got the fish. And so then we went back again and we took more eDNA. And this bottom section came out fine. No, no DNA detected. Up here, this area where we pulled the trout out, that looks fine. No DNA detected there. But then we had this pretty clear detection right here where we had, you know, pretty high, high certainty that it looks like there's probably a fish right there. And so this is kind of where I go back to like, we didn't really define um, what success was going to look like. And so we had a lot of discussions and some disagreements <laughs> with the Fish and Wildlife Service about what we needed to do at this point. Because, you know, if, if there's one fish left in there, is that is that okay? If we have one rainbow trout and we're gonna stock 30 Gila, or 30,000 Gila trout on top of that, like, is that acceptable? Or do we need to make sure that we get every single last fish out of the drainage? And in the end, that's um, pretty much what we decided was we'll go back and we'll do one more treatment. Um, so we went back in 2019, did one more treatment. So this entire red area is what we treated in 2019. Um, we really focused in on this, this problem section here with um, up at the top. Um, we did two treatments. We treated at two parts per million, uh, one hour buckets, and we did six hour treatments instead of four hour treatments. And that's pretty much the highest um, rate that you can use rotenonat, um, you know, in accordance with the label without getting some kind of exemption. Um, so we, we, we went in there, we did this, and we did collect one fish in that exact spot where the eDNA kind of told us that fish was. Um, it was right downstream of this pool, and um, there she is, <laughs> the, the $300,000 fish. Um, it was the only fish that we saw in the whole treatment, and we, we collected this fish, or we found this fish, um, during the first treatment, and then we did do a second treatment through that reach as well. And so this is just that same map kind of showing where those three were and then that star where the fish was. So it was, in some ways, it was kind of cool, like that eDNA told us exactly where that fish was going to be. Um, so then we did decide to go back right away about a month, so about, about a month after the, um, the treatment, kind of knowing it was risky because we don't know how long, I mean, we removed the fish, but we don't really know how long that DNA stays in the system and could be detected. But we did go back a month later um, and take uh, eDNA samples through this pink re, you know, section here, and we still got these positives. And so we were pretty worried about that um, over the winter. But then in May of 2020, we went back in, um, collected eDNA through this whole reach where the um, green dots are and everything came back as uh, no, no DNA detected. And so at this point, we, um, we were able to say like, let's go ahead, let's get Gila trout in there. And so in August of 2020, um, we flew fish in at I think five, four or five different locations throughout the drainage and um, stocked Gila trout in Whitewater Creek. And so there are Gila trout swimming around in Whitewater as we speak. Um, so I, I just wanted to go through uh, the timeline, I guess a little bit, because I think this is kind of interesting to see how long these uh, projects take. Um, the, the fire was in 2012. Um, and we kind of did some, some surveys to, to figure out where those fish were within the drainage um, from 2013 to 2015. 
in 2016, we kind of early 2016, we made that final decision of like, yep, we're going to do this project. We're going to, you know, we're going to go for it. And we had a kickoff meeting in 2016 with our project partners, the Gila National Forest and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and we began compliance in Jan in early 2016. We, uh, we hired contractors to complete the compliance for us. Um, in summer of 2017, we spent a lot of time doing recon trips. We had an engineer do an efficacy analysis of a, a waterfall, which did, is a barrier. Um, tons of planning, preparation. We did a variety of different staff um, trainings, clearing trails. We did some um, aerial recon of the project and then a lot of the on the ground recon. Um, you know, lots of compliance is required for a project like this. We did an EA. Um, we had to do, of course, ESA compliance. Um, a project, this pro kind of project requires a NIFTES permit. We have our own state uh, water quality control commission um, compliance that we have to go through. We had to get um, permission from the Forest Service for using helicopters in the wilderness area. That's the MRDG, it's a minimum tools analysis. And, and then we have to get a pesticide use permit from the forest as well. Um, so that's the summer 2017, but actually it was October. It was three days before we started the project. Um, the Forest Service signed the decision notice for NEPA and we got the go ahead. Um, we had three years of treatment and then um, stocking Gila trout in 2020. And generally our protocol for, heal, for establishing a new Gila trout population is that we will stock for three consecutive years and then, um, and then go back in and, and do surveys and hopefully document recruitment um, and reproduction in the stream. And so that's our plan for whitewater. Um, and then I just like to throw this in there just to kind of show what a project like this costs. Um, the first couple of years, I was really good at keeping track of costs and the second two years are a little bit more of estimates, but, um, and this is definitely a low end estimate because this is basically doesn't count um, the time, like office time that we've spent on this project. So it's mostly just like the field portions of the project. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would have no problem saying this is a, a million dollar uh, restoration project. And this project has, um, this is only game and fish expenses. I mean, we were primarily, um, you know, the, the main uh, agency that was doing the project, but Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service um, did also uh, provide help and participate as well. And so they would have their own expenses. Um, but our funding mostly for this project came from um, sport fish restoration money, state wildlife grant uh, money, our own, you know, game protection fund, and, um, you know, and, and, and that's primarily where the funding for the project came from. But the main resources um, really were in the personnel. Tons of, of people, like I said, we had anywhere between 40, I don't know, 20, 20 to 40 people on the ground out there. Basically our entire fisheries division was worked on this project when we were implementing it. Um, lots of money on helicopters, um, packing and trail work and, um, and then some of the other stuff that you think about like chemical and equipment are, are a smaller portion of the project. Um, so some of the lessons I think that we learned in this project is, you know, we've done a lot of treatments. There's our, our fisheries department um, has a ton of experience. You know, I, Kirk Patton has been doing projects for, you know, 15 years. Mike Rule has a lot of experience of um, doing restoration projects as do a lot of the rest of us, but you, these things really aren't predictable. Um, no matter how many you've done, there's always things that come up that you kind of don't, don't anticipate. And so you have to, you have to be flexible um, when you're doing these and, and just realize that, you know, you're gonna, there's gonna be challenges and obstacles and, and it might not go perfect that first year. I think one of the big questions that we had going into this project was, is something like this even possible in, a remote area, you know, a really difficult terrain um, in the wilderness. Um, is that possible? And I think it is. I think you can't do a lot of these if you want to keep your staff, <laughs> but, um, but it is possible. And 
it does require a lot of work and a, and a lot of resources and um, and good good people that that can can work in those conditions. Um, and then, as I said earlier, like you know, eDNA is a, a really great tool for detecting locations of those rare fish. I think that was something that was really interesting that we learned in this project, just seeing that pattern of detection and then, and then finding the fish in those exact locations. And obviously fish might be moving around. And so it's not, you know, always going to be predictable, but in our case, we were doing eDNA and went back three months later and found fish in that same location. So in our case, fish really didn't appear to be moving around very much. Um, but ET, eDNA is a really, a really good tool, I think, for, for this. And, and, um, and it worked. And like I said, it, you know, we learned a lot about using eDNA uh, for a project like this throughout this. And I think that you know, the big thing that we probably should have realized and discussed ahead of time was just defining success with our partner before the project starts. Um, we were really loose about that. And then there were, we did have differences in, um, in, in how, we, how we wanted to move forward when we were getting those really low levels of detections. And it, and it worked out, um, you know, we accomplished the project and there's Gila Trout in there now. So um, that's the end, <laughs> that's, that's all I have. So I don't know, Matt, if you wanna um, take over from here with questions or? Sure, Jill, I can jump on a second. I'm getting a little bit organized here trying to. Um, so first, thank you for the, the presentation, super impressive work. Um, and so you've got lots of kudos here going on in the chat box, um, including just the logistics as well as just the overall project. Uh, <laughs> remote challenging location, uh, working with down trees all over the place is really super impressive. Um, you also touched on a few things that we've talked about quite a bit in the community of practice, uh, things like working with uh, partners and funders, et cetera, to establish project goals and kind of the importance of what that means and how you're held to it. And it can lead to some expensive indi individual fish, which you talked about a little bit. Um, so with that, we do have a few questions and uh, feel free to keep those coming in, folks. Um, and I'll try to start getting through the list that we have. Um, so the first question I had um, is related to the toxicity of rotenone. Uh, I think for some folks that haven't used rotenone in their projects, and uh, the question is, is the chemical toxic, toxic to insects? And if so, uh, do you think it would affect the food items for Gila trout? Um, so yes, it is toxic to insects. Um, we, so we've been working on a project for Rio Grande cutthroat trout up in Northern New Mexico for, I don't know, the past 15 years or so. And we've collected initially in the beginning um, of that project collected quite a bit of invert data. And we do, um, and we, even with this project, we, we collect um, post and pre and post treatment um, invert collections to kind of look at that. And so there is, there is a loss of, of aquatic inverts right after a treatment that's kind of the same as you would see, you know, after a fire um, and ash flows and, and they recolonize really quickly. Um, so, you know, we, after, after some of these treatments, you go in three months later or six months later and there's caddis flies like covering the bottom of the stream um, because there's nothing there to eat them. Uh, so we really don't think that that's a limiting um, factor to reestablishing trout populations after these treatments because insects are mobile and they're really good at, at reestablishing. Awesome. Thank you, Joel. It seems like that those caddis flies would be a great prey base for when the, the Gila trout are reintroduced. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, next question. Um, is how long after treatment did you collect eDNA samples and what info did you use to determine if positive eDNA samples were from the last one from the one last fish or were from residual DNA? I think you touched on this a little bit, but maybe uh, more explicitly if you could chat about that. Yeah, so um, it kind of varied. So as far as that very last fish that we removed, we, um, we did the treatment, we removed the fish and we did eDNA collection, I believe a month later. So like literally four weeks later, and we still detected trout DNA at that same location. 
um, which then we did not detect subsequently. So the, my assumption there would be that that um, DNA that was detected, you know, a month later was residual tissue or residual DNA in the water. Um, for the other, otherwise we were mostly waiting, like we would do a treatment in the fall and then we would do eDNA collection in the spring. So like we would do the treatment in October and we would collect eDNA in May. And that seems to have been good. Like we weren't collecting, we weren't finding any residual DNA from, you know, prior, the year prior in that time frame. Um, so that's really, you know, that's, it's very anecdotal of like, right. it's just, um, you know, kind of what we saw. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't have anything. I mean, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And it, I think it just is so um, site specific. Like it just depends on the location. It depends on the water temperature. It depends on, you know, so many of those specific things. And there hasn't been a lot of research on that. There's been some research on it up in Alaska in lakes, but that doesn't really apply very well to our situation. Okay. Yeah, great. That's fascinating. And it kind of rolls into the next question here as well, um, which you mentioned. So confirming absence or success of eradica eradication seems really challenging, especially in larger systems. So the, um, I'm curious if you considered multiple detection tools in addition to eDNA, or if you did not have eDNA, like is the case right now, I assume, what would be your approach to confirming absence of uh, the non-native trout? Yeah, so this was the first project that we have used eDNA um, to confirm, you know, project success, basically. Um, prior to this, we used basically a combination of um, doing a treatment and not killing any fish, and then going back and doing electrofish, like some electrofishing surveys. And so because of the remoteness of this stream and, and how big of a drainage it is, we really didn't feel like doing electrofishing surveys was feasible. Um, and, but that in the, in the past for both Gila trout and cutthroat trout restorations that we've done in, in New Mexico, that's been the benchmark is not killing any fish and then doing an electrofishing survey. So if we would have used that as the benchmark here, we, and what we know now, we would have called the project good. We would have called the project complete, but there still would have been a fish in there. Because we did an electrofishing survey through that reach. We did not find a fish, but the eDNA detected it. So the, the electrofishing didn't find it. The eDNA did detect it. We did another survey or we did another treatment and we killed the fish. But if we would have used our, our previous criteria you know, without the eDNA, we would have called it good and we still would have had a rainbow trout in there. And so I think that was kind of part of our, like I said, sort of disagreement um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service was that, you know, is one fish really gonna, gonna swamp the project? But I, you never, you never know, you know, it could have been three fish in that spot. I mean, that's, there's, that's, that, those are the discussions that we had with them of, of what, where we needed to go after we got that last detection. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that's why the idea of goal setting and confirmation has been such a big discussion point yeah. for us. Um, and this kind of rolls into the next question, which I think you kind of answered. Um, so you, do you think that the last few fish could have been removed via electrofishing instead of the final rote known treatment? Um, I'm not sure if you exactly answered that and saying you did an electrofishing pass in that section and didn't get it. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, why didn't you stick with electrofishing to try to get rid of that last fish? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question because, um, because we say, so it, it has to do with public perception, a lot of it. I mean, I think that we could have been good with, with the, you know, electrofishing surveys to follow up. And I think if we would have, you know, if, if we would have not, if we, we still would have detected um, eDNA, you know, in 2020, we would not have done another treatment. I was not going to do another treatment in there. Um, because I mean, how many times I don't want to just keep doing something that doesn't work, you know? Um, but I, I think the issue around, um, electrofishing is that, 
you know, in general, when we're starting a project, we, in, in an environmental analysis, we're saying electrofishing is not a good tool for complete eradication of fish, which it is not. So we, we saw in here that we did two passes of electrofishing and we did not collect that fish, but we did kill that fish with a piscicide. So that backs up that statement. Um, I think that the situation that we were in is very different. Like if you're going into a stream that is, you know, has a thriving trout population, electrofishing is not a viable way to remove fish. That's It's gonna take years and years and years to be able to get to a point where there are no fish left. In the situation that we were in, where we are down to like, we know we have just one or two fish in there. Then yeah, I think that electrofishing and different forms of electrofishing. I mean, we talked about using bank shockers and um, preposition shockers and like doing some different, a little bit more novel things than just going in and backpack electrofishing to find those last few fish. I think those are options. But when you're dealing with the public, um, you know, they don't understand those nuances. And so I just think we have to be really careful with how um, how we present that information to the public because um, we don't want to jeopardize our, avail our ability to use pesticides in, in the future. And, and there's just a lot of nuances to when different methods are appropriate. Um, it's a lot more complicated than just like electrofishing bad, pesticide good. Um, and, and sometimes those are hard to communicate to the public. Oh, that's great. And we have a, a couple other questions related to treatment and we'll, we'll get to those first and then we'll uh, have some questions on the reintroduction that I want to make sure we have time for. Uh, so I think we'll have time here. So the, um, the first question is, if you did a similar project today, would you do the first treatment at the higher application rate uh, like you used in the third treatment or would you have started, uh, started the low dose and then ramped up again? Um, no, we would start with the lower dose. Um, I think, you know, our following the label, our best practices, you know, our responsibility um, to the environment is to do the least, um, the least, you know, start at the least and move up if we need to. I think that um, what, what I would change would be um, just the flexibility of the project, um, being able to create more flexibility and scheduling and the logistics and time frame and things like that to be able to adjust as necessary. And that was something we didn't have um, the first year because like I said, this project is logistically was so complicated that we were, we had a schedule of like, we're moving gear from this camp to this camp to this camp. And that was all set up already. Um, and we had helicopters scheduled to come and move things. And so there was no flexibility in that. And so when we realized like, oh, this isn't working, we need to, we need to change. We need to figure out a different approach. We need, we need something different. We didn't, our schedule was so rigid that we didn't have the ability to do that. And so I think that was kind of the, um, the downfall of that first year was that we just didn't have the flexibility built in. And I think if I, you know, going forward and if we were to do another project like this, it, building that flexibility in and, and realizing, um, you know, things, things probably aren't gonna go exactly as we plan and we need to be able to, to adapt as we go and we need to have that flexibility in, in, the, in the plan. Right. Awesome, so uh, gonna jump for a second from the technical side to the permitting side of things. Um, interesting question here is, was there a biological opinion generated under section seven for the project? And the more detail on that was that Whitewater Creek was proposed as critical habitat for the narrow-headed garter snake uh, was con considered occupied until the uh, 2012 fire, fire. And the garter snake is strictly piscivorous. Um, so interesting question there on both the permitting side and you know unintended, unintended consequences on other native species. So maybe if you could speak to that. Yes, um, so we did, um, we did do a consultation and we did um, have a BO for narrow-headed garter snake and we had a bunch of, um, uh, well, we had to do like all of the staff that was on the ground had to have snake identification training. Um, we had to have protocols set up for if we did um, encounter a narrow-headed garter snake, um, how we would capture it, hold it, um, translocate it, um, all of that kind of stuff. So we did, yes. Okay. And we never saw a garter snake. 
Well, I'm sad that you never saw a garter snake. Um, well, we not <laughs> I never had a garter snake. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so we're gonna we're getting close to time here, but I do want to wrap up by um, asking a question or two on the native Gila trout reintroductions. Um, so let me make sure I have here. Okay, so a couple questions on how many trout were stocked, um, and on um, okay, so how many Gila trout trout were stocked? The length of distribution of those um, were historical lineages represented. Where did the founder fish come from, etc. So the uh, question on you know where those Gila trout came from and the, the lineages, I guess. Sure. So um, I don't remember the exact number. I know Tom Ty is on. Um, he might have those numbers, but I think there were around fifteen thousand Gila trout that were stocked in the in twenty twenty. Um, there were fish of every um, remnant lineage that were uh, represented in that stocking. So all lineages went into um, white water. And as far as um, distribution, we stocked at four, I believe four different locations throughout the drainage. So we stocked basically at the top, in the middle, at the bottom, and in the South Fork. Excellent. So um, along with that, you know, I know this was recent, um, 2020, very interesting year for everybody. Uh, but the question was, um, have you, are you uh, monitoring the success of the trout that are introduced? So do you plans to monitor survival, um, et cetera, for the fish that were dropped in the, in the creek? Yes. Um, so our, generally our, our protocol or strategy in establishing new Gila trout populations is that we stock fish for three consecutive years. And then on the fourth year, we'll go back in and do um, surveys and, and that will be placed into our, you know, ongoing monitoring of all the Gila trout populations. So, so it'll probably get monitored on a three to five year rotation. And because we did stock um, all lineages um, in, in the project area, we're planning on also doing kind of a, um, a genetic monitoring uh, study uh, for this project, hopefully to sort of monitor how those different lineages are um, dispersing throughout the drainage and then how they're, um, you know, it interbreeding with one another. Awesome. Okay, so um, we are at the top of the hour, so I do want to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, but a couple words here in closing for the group. Uh, the first is uh, Christy is working on dropping a couple links um, into the chat box here uh, for this case study because we do have it as a case study on CCAST. Um, so you'll see those links in there. Um, I do want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us, uh, especially Jill. Thanks for the presentation. That was awesome. A really impressive project. And you covered a lot in 45 minutes or so. So I really <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, this webinar was recorded and we'll make it available on the CCAST YouTube channel, uh, which Christy will put a link for in the chat if she hasn't already. Uh, we should be able to get that up within a week or so. Um, and you can also uh, view previous webinars um, that we've hosted up there as well. Um, Let's see. So we're, uh, this is the last webinar we have scheduled right now. We're working on lining up speakers for the coming months and have a couple um, presentations planned for June that we'll be announcing soon. Um, if you're not yet receiving our announcements and you would like to, feel free to contact us directly, either myself or Christy. Uh, you should still be able to see our email addresses toward the beginning of the chat. Um, I think that's all I had. Uh, I want to thank again, thank you all again for your time. And Jill, really thanks again for the excellent presentation um, and for taking the time to prepare and talk with us today. And with that, I think we'll call it. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your week.